afternoon, sports fans, and welcome to today's lecture on chariot racing in the ancient Roman world. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're stepping out of the arena and into the circus. That's right, we're going to be investigating Rome's most popular, most fanatical, longest lasting set of spectacles, the Fast and Furious Chariot Races. Now, most people might assume from modern TV and modern movies, from things like Gladiator and Spartacus, that the gladiatorial games were kind of the thing when it came to spectacle in ancient Rome. But as we'll see today, the gladiatorial games sort of kind of pale in comparison to other chariot races, which drew larger crowds, developed more fanatical spectators, and lasted far, far longer than their gladiatorial counterparts. In fact, chariot racing, more than any other spectacle, became the most professional of all sports in ancient Rome, a veritable industry with rich owners, hundreds of employees, and thousands of dollars spent to please the crowds and to win fame and glory. So whether you're looking for a kind of relaxing horse ride, or you'd rather trample your foes on your way to a triumphant victory, journey with me as we investigate chariot racing in ancient Rome. So this obviously isn't our first time talking about chariot racing in this course, right? So we saw chariot races were part of the very earliest mythological games we've got records of, right? The funeral games of Patroclus. And chariot racing was added as an Olympic event not too long after that, 680 BCE. Moreover, we've seen that chariot races weren't just a Greek thing, right? So the Etruscans held their own chariot races, often preferring two or three horse chariots to the standard four horse chariots of the Greeks. Now debate still rages amongst scholars about the influence of Greek and Etruscan chariot racing on the ancient Roman version of chariot racing. Superficially, for example, the Roman circus looks a lot like a Greek hippodrome. It's large and elongated and rounded on one end and flat on the other. But all sorts of kind of little details make Roman chariot racing seem, well, pretty uniquely Roman with things like factions of fans and a central barrier in the circus and the position of the finish line. What we do know is that chariot racing in the ancient Roman world has an equally deep and distant history, and it became equally, if not greater, a part of Roman sport and spectacle. Now the Circus Maximus, or the Great Track as it translates, was the place to go watch chariot races in the city of ancient Rome. The Roman historian Livy says that it was founded by Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, also known as Tarquin the Elder, the fifth king of Rome who ruled in the 6th century or the 500s BCE. Now, this is a little shaky to say the least, so Livy was writing like 600 years after this occurred. But regardless of when exactly it was founded, the circus itself remained pretty plain for the first few hundred years. Future kings and consuls added limited seating usually just for other elites in the city of Rome. And then it was the infamous Julius Caesar in the first century BCE that truly expanded the permanent seating in the circus for all rungs of society. And you can see why the regular people of Rome loved him, right? The circus continued to undergo improvements and renovations and additions throughout the early imperial period. And it likely sat at this time 
around 150,000 spectators by the middle of the Roman Empire. Think about this. Our largest football stadium today seats a little under 110,000 uh, spectators. This is almost 50% more than that. Now, even in the late empire, when Rome was falling apart politically and economically, and even geographically fragmenting, the chariot races never declined. In fact, they seemed to grow more and more popular as time went on. Chariot races continued deep into late antiquity, long after the Roman capital was moved from the city of Rome to the site of Constantinople in modern-day Turkey. Fun fact, now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. It's Istanbul, not Constantinople. Anyway, modern scholars signal this shift by calling it Byzantine, right? The Byzantine rather than the Roman Empire, even though the people at the time still called themselves the Roman Empire. And as gladiatorial games eventually declined with the rise of Christianity, chariot races, they remained as popular as ever. And during the late empire, there were a ton of these. So chariot races took place on 66 days per year with usually 24 races on each of those days, meaning there would have been more than 1,500 races per year during the later part of the Roman Empire. Absolutely incredible in terms of its scale and frequency. All right, so what were you actually in for if you went to the chariot races in Roman antiquity? Well, the spectacular structure of the Circus Maximus, that was only the beginning. Prior to the actual chariot races, there was a huge procession, known in Latin as the pompa, where images of the gods were paraded around the track. These could be followed by all manners of entertainers, race officials, dancers, acrobats, musicians. Now, after the procession, these divine statues were then taken up to the pulvinar, the Latin term for the imperial skybox. Imagine the most baller set of box seats you've ever seen, multiply that by 100, and you've got some idea of how sweet that thing must have been. Anyway, in the Pulvinar, the cult statues would watch over the games, along with the emperor, helping to ensure fair play by everyone involved. After the entire pompa had proceeded, the chariots were put into 12 starting gates, which functioned almost exactly like those at a modern horse track. The sponsor of the games then, known as the Editor, Editor Spectacularum, or the Provider of Spectacles, would drop a white cloth or handkerchief onto the track as a sort of kind of get ready signal. And then this was followed by a vocal signal and the opening of the gates. The gates themselves were attached to a spring mechanism, so they would all mechanically open at the exact same time, ensuring fairness in the race. Now, after the gates opened, the chariots sprinted out from the flat end of the track towards the curved end of the track, looking to be the first to make the turn around the thing known as the Eurepus, or the spine that divided the middle of the track. This later became known as the spina, and that's actually kind of the more common term from it, but that term spina actually only gets used and only becomes popular in very late antiquity, in the 6th century or the 500 CE. Now this divider, right, the Eurepus, is one of the main differences between Greek and Roman chariot racing. Since Greek chariots raced around a turning pole at the far end, but didn't have a formal divider in the center of the track. And this must have, uh, it must have resulted in dangerous and often deadly collisions between chariots racing head on towards each other. So in that way, that divider provides a little bit, at least a modicum of safety. Now in the first part of the race, chariots had to stay in their lanes, just like modern track or speed skating. And then after reaching the appropriate point, then they tried to fight their way as close as possible to the Eurepus or the Spina, since this provided the shortest distance around the track. Now charioteers also had some help. So each team had someone known as a hortator, or a horseback rider who could shout directions and strategies to the charioteer. So it'd be somebody riding a horse kind of alongside them, telling them and giving them advice in terms of what to do. The race itself consisted of seven laps around the track, each being around 1,500 meters, uh, almost a mile. And races could end up being pretty physical, so bumping was allowed, and it was pretty common. And because the chariots were pretty light, this could often send them flying when they made contact with the spina, or with the walls, or with other chariots. Now deaths, they weren't necessarily common, but they weren't really uncommon either. 
And a huge number of the archaeological depictions that we have of chariot races from the Roman world, they show and they highlight iconographically some sort of crash, demonstrating the frequency with which this must have occurred in the Roman world. Now, on the seventh lap, the first team to cross the finish line, which was located direct, directly across from the judge's box, was declared the winner. They then take a victory lap and then head up to the judge's box to claim their prizes. A palm branch and a wreath, both kind of reminiscent of Greek sports victories, and what could be a significant sum of money, something that was certainly absent from the Panhellenic Games. Now, charioteers occupied a kind of weird space within Roman society. They were most frequently slaves or freedmen, so among kind of the lower classes of Roman society. And just like gladiators and actors and pimps and prostitutes, charioteers were considered socially infames, or disreputable persons barred from certain legal and political and religious rights. So, for example, right, they couldn't testify in a Roman court. And so, much like Etruscan sport and the Roman gladiatorial games, the focus here is not so much on the charioteers as it is on the owners of the horses and the hosts of the games and the spectators in the sand, stands, rather than on the athletes and the participants themselves. Hence why we call them spectacles rather than sport to some degree. But through racing, these charioteers could become among the most popular and wealthy people in all the Roman world. Even slave charioteers would make money from their wins, and with that money, they could purchase their freedom. And as freedmen, they could become fabulously wealthy. So the Roman poet Juvenal talked about how a charioteer could make more money in a single race than a teacher could make in an entire year of working. Sounds a lot like the modern world when you put it like that. I guess teachers were getting hosed on salary on the salary front back in the ancient Roman world as well. Ah, anyway, enough of my complaints. So, just like gladiators, charioteers could become rich and famous, uh, yet they would never have quite the same noble status as the senatorial or equestrian elite in the city of Rome. Now, we can also get a sense for just how popular and frequent these games were from the inscriptions concerning charioteers. So, the Roman poet Martial said that one charioteer, a guy by the name of Scorpus, won more than 2,000 races and he died at the age of 26. He didn't just participate in 2000, he won 2000 races before he died at the age of 26. Now another inscription details the career of a charioteer named Gaius Apuleius Diocles. And this guy won an incredible 1,462 races in his career, out of a total of 4,257 races that he participated in. And this was over the course of a 24 year career. Now, when you do the math and the calculations on that, that's about 177 races every year. One almost every other day of his life for 24 years. But not all careers lasted that long, though. One of the saddest Roman inscriptions you'll ever read is the epitaph or a tombstone of Sextus Vestilius Hellenus, whose career as a charioteer was cut short at the very young age of 13. He apparently was an up-and-comer who'd just been traded from one team to another when tragedy struck in the circus and he passed away. So once again, we have somewhat strange situation when it comes to the role of charioteers in Roman society, right? So in some ways, they were the lowest of the low, infames and slaves and freedmen. And in other ways, they were the exact opposite, right? They could become incredibly rich, amazingly popular, and the focus for fans from across the empire. Now, once again, I think this highlights the idea that sports like chariot racing in Rome privileged the hosts and the owners and the spectators rather than the athletes, even though those athletes could uh, kind of adopt a somewhat paradoxical position within Roman society, becoming wealthy, but still being relatively lower class when it comes to kind of their, their, their position within society. Now, fans of the ancient Roman chariot races were just as crazy as fans of college football today. And this fanaticism, which of course gives us our word fan, right? Fanaticism, fan, is the result of the structure that emerged within ancient Roman chariot racing. So rather than having each chariot independently owned and operated, there were four main teams known as factions 
that were identified by their colors. So you had the red team, the white team, the blue team, and the green team. And in Rome, the greens became the most popular, and especially the most popular, of the emperor himself. Now, each one of these teams had their own rich aristocratic owner who ran the entire team and funded the entire business. And that business could be absolutely huge, frequently more than 200 people employed by this guy. So you've got the owner himself, you've got a high-level manager, you've got the people involved in the actual race, right, the charioteer and the hortator who would uh, help coach on horseback, and then you've got all the trainers and the attendants, the people who'd pace the horses and the people who'd dry them off after the races. All in all, this was very big business. And like any good big business, it paid and it paid well. So fans would go absolutely bonkers for their favorite team. It really does seem similar to rabid college or pro football fans in today's world. Now, the Roman poet Juvenal mocked that when the Greens, right, the most popular team in ancient Rome, when that team lost, it was worse than the Battle of Cannae in Rome. And just in case you haven't taken my Meet the Ancients class, the Battle of Cannae is commonly seen as the worst Roman military defeat ever in the Roman Republic. Tens of thousands of Romans died at the Battle of Cannae at the hands of Hannibal, generally considered the worst de military defeat for Rome for hundreds and hundreds of years. So yeah, people got upset when their team lost. Another crazy fan story takes place in the aftermath of a major chariot collision. So the charioteer of the red team, a guy by the name of Felix, which actually translates as lucky, turns out he was not so lucky. Anyway, Felix died in the collision and his supporters gathered to place the body on the funeral pyre and light it ablaze to burn the body. But once burning, a crazy red faction supporter threw himself upon the blazing red hot fire, burning himself alive, not being able to live or go on any longer without his favorite charioteer. And when the other factions heard about this, they had to spread the rumor that this was an accident just to prevent everyone from knowing how die-hard fanatical the crazy red faction fans actually were. Oh, and as an added bonus, all this was recorded apparently in something called the Acta Diurna, which translates as the Daily Acts, suggesting that there was some sort of kind of like daily newspaper or gazette that heavily featured sports outcomes like chariot racing. Now, just like with modern pro sports, Free agency was a big deal in ancient, chari ancient Roman chariot racing. So charioteers could flip from one faction to another. And your favorite charioteer one day might be your hated rival the next day. Now the Roman author Pliny commented that fans were so dedicated to their color faction that if everyone, right, all the charioteers simply switched colors, their loyalty would follow right along with them. And if you've wondered where you heard that before, this is a classic Seinfeld joke. I so just like modern sports fans, ancient spectators, they were completely rooting for clothes, just like modern fans of baseball teams. Loyalty to any one sports team is pretty hard to justify because the players are always changing. The team can move to another city. You're actually rooting for the clothes when you get right down to it. You know what I mean? You are standing and cheering and yelling for your clothes to beat the clothes from another city. <laughs> will be so in love with a player, but if he goes to another team, they boo him. This is the same human being in a different shirt. They hate him now. Boo! Different shirt! Boo! Okay, so, uh, the Roman elite authors found that this sort of fanaticism was rather beneath them, right? So to the aristocrats, like Pliny, the same guy who provided the basis for Seinfeld's joke, well, Pliny laments how invested regular people were in sports, saying that, quote unquote, when I think of how this futile, tedious, monotonous business can keep them sitting endlessly in their seats, I take pleasure myself in the fact that their pleasure is not mine, right? Saying all this stuff was really below him. And it was the Roman poet Juvenal, right, who was somewhat condescending when he said that it was panem et circensis, right? bread and circuses. That was all it took to make the people of Rome happy and content and placated. Now, Roman aristocrats may have preferred their leisure time filled with art and literature and philosophy, but for the regular Roman citizens, it was all about the spectacles, all about the chariot races. And you can count me in that camp as well. It would have been cool to see.
Now, the races also gave Roman citizens a unique moment to gather together, to connect with one another. So in the upper levels of the stands, rich mixed with poor, and everyone had the chance to see and to be heard by the actual Roman emperor, one of the only instances in ancient Rome where this was possible. Now, during the empire, the emperor had a private bridge that stretched from his residence on the Palatine Hill to his lux luxury box, right, the Pulvinar, at the Circus Maximus. And this luxury box, which we touched upon earlier, gave the emperor the best seat in the house. Not only could he watch the games, but he could be assured that everyone in attendance knew that he was the one responsible for putting them on, right? That he was being generous towards his people and that they had him to thank for their entertainment that day. But this communi communication happens both ways. So not only could the emperor ensure that the people knew that he was the one to thank, but the people could let the emperor know what they thought about the current state of affairs. So coordinated chants would often emerge and the crowds could comment on the emperor himself. And ancient Roman authors would often use the emperor's relationship with the games as a way to kind of comment on how good or bad that historian thought the emperor was. So when writing about Tiberius, for example, he's shown in a negative light for not liking the games, preferring to hide reclusively in his villa on the island of Capri. Now Caligula his, Caligula, his successor, was almost the exact opposite. He absolutely loved the games. But to ancient Roman historians, he loved them a little bit too much, not just presiding over them, but participating in them as a gladiator and a charioteer and a dancer, which was, as the Roman historians thought, very unemperorly, right? Now Caligula also fixed the chariot races so that his favorite faction, the Greens, would always win making it maybe a little bit less exciting than if it really was going on under fair play. And once, when the crowd chanted at him in the hopes of getting some tax relief, he had the, the kind of cheer organizers who started that chant arrested and then killed. I guess telling the emperor what you really thought could have some pretty dire consequences in Roman antiquity. But during the early part of the Roman Empire, crazy people like Caligula and Nero they were the exception rather than the rule. So Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher emperor, right, ruling in the second part or the second half of the second century AD, dutifully put on the games, even though he himself wasn't a very big fan. He knew that people liked them. He would have preferred probably, you know, reading a book instead. Augustus as well, the first emperor of Rome, he threw plenty of both gladiatorial games and chariot races to please the people of Rome and make them more inclined to accept a radically new form of government. And the ancient Roman author Pliny highlights the games and the chariot races as part of what made the Roman emperor Trajan the best and greatest of all the emperors. He encouraged fair play, and he likely, even, he likely put on evenly fought gladiatorial fights and chariot races, and he let spectators freely express themselves and their opinions. And so the circus, right, and the chariot games within the circus, they were more than just for fun. They were an important way for Roman emperors to demonstrate their power and their generosity, and for Roman spectators to express their opinion of the emperor. Now, one of the most impressive things about chariot racing is just how stinking long it remained popular. So it started way before the gladiatorial games in Rome, and it remained popular long after the gladiatorial games were banned by early Christian emperors. But eventually, chariot racing did decline in popularity, and we don't really have chariot races in the same way today. So in terms of the specifics, right, perhaps the closest modern parallel is something like harness racing, where a person rides in a two-wheel cart sort of thing that's attached to a single horse. Now let's not pretend that this is the most popular sport in the world, and there's a good chance that you may never have heard of it. I just kind of recalled this image and looked it up and Googled around, but I wasn't even really that familiar with it prior to this. But there are some similarities here, right? I mean, the driver is in a wheeled cart and he is pulled by a horse, and that does seem pretty chariot-like to me. But at the same time, there are a number of differences. So for one, the cart is only pulled by a single horse, rather than two or three or four horses like you are in Greek or Roman or Etruscan antiquity. Second, the driver sits instead of stands in the cart. And third, and somewhat weirdly at least to me, in this harness racing, horses aren't allowed to sprint. 
they have to either trot or to pace. They're not allowed to gallop. So kind of a strange sport, and if you ask me, it loses some of its appeal of the chaos of ancient Roman chariot racing. Now, another way to think of this is something like NASCAR racing, right, whose popularity is far closer to what chariot racing would have been in antiquity. And with NASCAR, we certainly get the attachment of fans to certain drivers. But it seems like this was more of a, it is more of a kind of driver-based attachment rather than a faction or team-based attachment that we get in Roman antiquity. You might lump horse racing, again, kind of a more popular form of harness racing, into the distant parallel with ancient Roman chariot racing as well. But again, here people are more attached to individual horses rather than teams or factions. And when you think of horse racing, kind of outside of the big events like the Kentucky Derby or the Preakness or the Belmont, well, most people who were there they're probably there to bet on the horses rather than kind of enjoy a day of pomp and spectacle. So overall, the parallel here is kind of tough, right? Nothing seems quite satisfactory, although for my money, probably NASCAR, that might be the best parallel in the modern world. Now, if you have a different opinion, I don't blame you at all. I think this could go in a lot of different ways based on the features that you assess. So think about it and decide for yourself which modern sport does best parallel the chaotic and, uh, and fan-fueled world of ancient Roman chariot racing. All right, you have made it to the end of another episode. And in today's lecture, we've taken a look at ancient Roman chariot racing, by far the most popular sport and spectacle in the ancient Roman world. Now, we saw that there would have been more than 1,500 races per year just in the city of Rome, and that the ancient Roman authors thought that this, more than anything else, is what kept people happy, right? Panem et circenses, bread and circuses to please the people. And we've seen that ancient Roman chariot racing, it was based on factions or teams represented by different colors, right? So the red team, the white team, the blue team, and the green team and that spectators often developed incredibly passionate attachments to their favorite faction. The races themselves were often chaotic and dangerous, with chariots making hairpin turns around the Euripus or the Spina in the middle of the track. But the games were also, they were more than about just spectacle. The races allowed the regular people of Rome a venue for directly addressing the Roman emperor, with their thoughts, with their complaints, and with their congratulations or appreciation of his rule. And in return, the emperor could use the races as a way to show his power over in generosity towards his people. Now, unlike with the chariot races, you can all win in this course. So take the reins, fight through the chaos, and drive your study habits like they're thoroughbred horses. Just a few lessons you can take away from ancient Roman chariot racing. <laughs>